In this lecture, we shall consider the origins of deconstruction in the theories of Derrida, particularly as they were first presented to America in his famous or perhaps infamous lecture, Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences. Jacques Derrida reads the history of Western metaphysics as a continual search for a logos or originary presence. Derrida says, yes, all of Western metaphysics is logocentric. And he finds that a problem. He says we keep trying to find a logos and origin. We can't get that out of our system. Now, he says the reason it is so much a part of philosophy is the reason is that this logos, if you can find it, it promises to give meaning and purpose to all things, to act as a universal center, a transcendental signified that all signifiers can be referred back to. In other words, we want the logos because we want a center. We want something that is the origin of everything. And we want what he, what he calls again a transcendental signified. Now remember, a signified is what the word refers back to. The signifier returns back to the signified. A transcendental signified would be something that all the signifieds themselves point back to. We want something that will put a capstone, that will be the top and the origin and everything, that will be like a god, sort of, that will answer all questions and be the behind all references, all signification. He says, we desire that. Now, behind this search, Derrida says, is a desire for a higher reality, a full presence that is beyond and thus not implicated in the play of structure. We want presence. We want to know there's something there. And we want to know there's something there that is pure and undefiled. Not just a God that is there, but like a consciousness, a personality, that we have something inside of us that is a presence, that's real, that's undefiled. We yearn for that. We're hungry for it, and we reach for it, something that is not caught up in structure. Now, he claims, Western philosophy since Plato has simply renamed this presence and shifted this center without ever breaking from its centering impulse. And that's sort of what I told you in Lecture 21. In fact, I borrowed that a little bit from Derrida. I kind of use it against him, maybe. But I borrowed a little bit because I think Derrida's right, that even though different philosophers have different names for the Logos, it's basically the same centering impulse. Now, actually, Derrida says that is what metaphysics is. To Derrida, metaphysics is looking for a logo. So he would say he's not a metaphysician. We might call him that, but he's saying he's not a metaphysician because he doesn't want a logos, as we'll see. Now, here's the fun part. Derrida says that even the structuralists, the modernists, have sought a center, a fixed locus or presence or origin. In other words, they haven't really decentered. They keep saying, we decentered, we got rid of the center. No, they didn't. Their decentering is just that juxtaposition. They just brought the margin to the center and came up with a new center. Now, structure forms the center rather than logos. But they're still thinking in a centering way. And so they're not really any different, is what Derrida is saying. They, the structuralists, have broken from the old metaphysic, okay, but they still use its terminology and its binaries. Though they sometimes reverse the binaries, they still think in terms of them. And that's part of logocentrism. If you're thinking in terms of binaries, in a way, you're still looking for a center. Maybe that center is not God anymore. Maybe that center is actually physical, but it's still a center. And you're still thinking in terms of binaries, one privileged over the other. Derrida, and here comes the word, would deconstruct all such attempts to posit a center or to establish a system of binaries. He would replace it instead with a full free play of meaning. Let's look at that carefully. The word deconstruction simply means that we're going to take this centering impulse and deconstruct it. Take the binary and break it in half. That's, that's on a simple level what deconstruction means. Break down the old metaphysic. Break down the old binary way of looking at things. Again, instead of that, what Derrida wants again is what he calls a full free play of meaning. He doesn't want to be uh, put into any system, Derrida. Now, interestingly, this is a little bit like that play drive of Schiller again that we looked at in Lecture 11. But the difference is, or what Derrida would say the difference is, is that Schiller's free play 
is really not a free play because Schiller is still trying to keep a metaphysic, keep some kind of belief in God, a belief in transcendence or whatever. So it's not really a free play because you still have sort of counters or measures that you've got to stay within, boundaries, if you will. Derrida says his play is a full free play of meaning because it's got nothing to stop it. There's no presence, there's no center, there's no logos to stop that free play of meaning uh, from going in any direction. So again, Derrida is saying, maybe people before me said they were looking for a free full play. Maybe they said they were breaking the old metaphysic, but they really weren't. That's up to me. And that's why it's another paradigm shift from modernism to postmodernism. Modernism switches the binary. Deconstruction wants to break the binary. Maybe that's an easy way to describe it. All right. Derrida's theories, as I've presented them, were first made public in a 1966 lecture. It was at Johns Hopkins. And it was called Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences. And basically, this lecture is generally accepted as the birthday of deconstruction in America. Deconstruction was in Europe a little before us. It always comes to America after Europe. But um, that's the birthday. That's basically when deconstruction begins in our country. A little bit about terminology. Deconstruction, postmodernism, and poststructuralism are all used pretty much interchangeably. I mean, if you want to really be precise, postmodernism and poststructuralism is equivalent, and deconstruction is a form of postmodernism or poststructuralism, but they're still used fairly interchangeably. Now, in this essay, Structure, Sign, and Play, Derrida, ironically, spends more time attacking and deconstructing modern theorists than he does the traditional ones. So the fun thing about it, I mean, if you're somebody that's not crazy about modernism or postmodernism, you may actually have fun. Because he doesn't even bother attacking Plato or Kant directly. He attacks all the people from the left. So Saussure, uh, I mentioned Levi Strauss, you know, but all these other people, he deconstructs them. So it is a little bit of fun. It's kind of like, I don't know if you know this, but Karl Marx, he did not agree with any other Marxists. I mean, any other Marxists, he said, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. There's only pure Marxists. It's kind of funny. Well, Derrida, he's not really irascible, actually. He's kind of a fun fellow. But he has fun breaking down all the pretensions of the structuralists. And you know what it's like? I think one of the reasons deconstruction is so popular, I'm being a little critical here, but um, part of the reason they attacked Socrates and put him to death was because all of Socrates' followers were using his techniques, his Socratic dialogue, to go around and break down all the ideas of their elders, right? What's more fun for a college student than to go up to some authority figure and use reason and logic to show them that they're a fool? I really think this is why deconstruction is so popular amongst graduate students particularly, because it's fun to... It's the anxiety of influence again. Isn't it the Oedipal thing? It's fun to deconstruct people. You get into it. It's a lot of fun. And again, uh, sometimes, I mean, Derrida's pretty wild, but sometimes his followers are even more deconstructive than he is. And uh, again, it just reminds me of those sophists. And I'm going to actually link deconstruction to sophistry because it has fun breaking down arguments. All right. In his lecture, Derrida identifies three forerunners to what he's doing. Nietzsche, Freud and Martin Heidegger. We haven't talked about him, but he's a famous philosopher. Now, the funny thing is, even these guys get deconstructed, but they get deconstructed less than the other ones, because he really likes them. Let me show you how they're the pre predecessors or forerunners of, of Derrida, at least the way he explains it. First, Nietzsche. Nietzsche is a predecessor of, of Derrida because he, Nietzsche, did away with such concepts as being and truth showing them to be arbitrary and in constant play. Not only did, did Nietzsche show us that there is no absolute truth, he actually showed that truth itself was constantly changing and in play. And that's an idea that Derrida is going to agree with. And so, you know what's interesting? Nietzsche is really the true father of modernism and postmodernism. He is an incredibly important figure in Western metaphysics. I mean, you can love him or hate him, but without him, things would be different. I mean, that's true maybe of every philosopher, but particularly Nietzsche. He sets the groundwork for modernism, as I described it in the last two lectures, and the groundwork for deconstruction, the next two lectures, these two lectures. All right, what about Freud? Freud did away with the faith that the subjective self or consciousness can function as a logocentric presence or a transcendental signify. In other words, if Nietzsche kills ontology, Freud kills epistemology. I mentioned something I mentioned before. In other words, Freud shows us that, you know, even our consciousness, our, our, our self, can't function as a logos. Even that is, is, is broken down. 
So, again, Freud uh, finishes what Nietzsche starts in that sense, or they're doing it you know, fairly similar. Um, now, a way to put it is that Freud demystified that nostalgic, romantic turn inward that would seek to posit itself and its ego as a fixed, stable center. It's easy for romantic-minded people, and in some ways Freud is a romantic. He's an anti-romantic, but he's also a romantic. And, you know, there's that romantic thing that says, well, nothing else is true. There's no God, there's no truth, but there's me. <laughs> well, Freud does away with that faith that me, my ego, can form a fixed, stable center, as it does oftentimes for a lot of artists. You know, a lot of artists reject everything, but they have recourse to themselves as the center of all meaning, and that's how they fix and stabilize meaning. They make themselves into the transcendental signified. In other words, all meaning eventually goes back to them, and that's what gives it the unity. Well, Freud problematized that by saying, you know, no, we're the product of unconscious forces. Finally, Heidegger did away with the metaphysical concept of being as presence, of any eternal pre-existent I am. Now, Heidegger is very hard to explain, but again, the basic idea here is that there's no more presence. Even, even we ourselves, we don't carry some kind of presence with us. I think the easiest way to understand this is to have recourse once again to Sartre's idea of existence preceding essence. Even though we are, we, we be or something, we're a being, we don't carry an essence with us. That essence is produced as we act in the world, as we create. Our existence gives way to essence. Maybe is the easiest way uh, to understand that in a nutshell. So, again, the reason these three people are forerunners, again, is because all of them are breaking down all possibilities for a fixed center or stable origin or, again, transcendental signified. Now, in the rest of the lecture, I want to show you that what Derrida is really doing is breaking from Western metaphysics. And to break from Western metaphysics means to break from two things, Platonism and Christianity. Because the Platonic mindset and the Christian mindset, especially as they were brought together in Augustine, that's why he's so important, is that's really the Western tradition. Well, Derrida breaks both. I want to show you how. Let's start with Plato. All right. In rejecting logocentrism and its earliest proponent, Plato, who sort of invented logocentrism, Derrida has reaffirmed the foundational tenets of Plato's nemesis, Gorgias the Sophist. Plato's great enemy, the one that Plato had to you know, disprove or outdo, was a sophist named Gorgias. Now, according to Gorgias, he had these three propositions. Some of you may be uh, familiar with these. Gorgias' three propositions were, number one, nothing exists. Now, he doesn't mean there's no matter. He means nothing, no presence exists is really what he means in the Derrida sense. Nothing exists. Number two, if it exists, it cannot be known. Number three, if it can be known, it cannot be communicated. Now, those are his three propositions. And again, much of Platonism, we might say, is an attempt to answer that. Well, I'm going to show how deconstruction goes back to those three propositions of Gorgias. Let's, let's go through it. First of all, Gorgias's first proposition Nothing exists. In place of that, Derrida argues that there exists no pure, undifferentiated presence, no norm, no center, no touchstone against which all other imitations can be measured. I think that's pretty clear. Nothing exists. There's no logos. There's no center. The other ones are a little more difficult. All right. Proposition two. If it exists, it cannot be known. Even if it does exist, let's, let's say there is a logos. It doesn't make a difference because it cannot be known. Here's Derrida's version. And Derrida doesn't say this. This is my critique or way of explaining Derrida, I should say. I think if he saw this, he probably would agree, but I want to say this is my critique. Derrida asserts our inability to find a clear way back to any originary presence or even any controlling system of logic. For, so for Derrida, too, even if there is a logos, a transcendental signified, we can't get there. There's no way to get back to a pure origin, to a transcendental signified. Even if it exists, it's impossible to get back. Now, Derrida expresses this inability in a word that he coined, différence. Now, in, in French, that's D-I-F-F-E-R-E-N-C-E. -E. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Derrida spells it A-N-C-E at the end. The way, the shorthand is to say différence with an A. He invented the word. Now, this word is a pun, and it's untranslatable, but I'll explain to you the way it works in French. Now, the word différence with an A is actually a pun 
that plays on two French words, the French word for difference and the French word for to defer. That's how he made that word. Now, I'll explain why that's important in one moment, but let me show you the other reason. Okay, difference with an E and difference with an A are pronounced exactly the same in French. And so, what he does with that word is he breaks down one of the oldest binaries of speech writing. It was believed, as I mentioned earlier, that speech was pure. You know, it's, it's closer to the logos, whereas writing is a kind of a dirty thing. It's a physical thing. Well, what he shows is, wait a minute, if speech is so pure, if I say difference, you don't know which one I'm talking about until I write it down. So that word is a little, it's almost like a one-word poem, poem that breaks down this faith in that binary. All right, let's come back, though, to the more important difference and defer. All right, like the structuralist, Derrida does privilege difference over sameness. He agrees with it. He agrees that meaning comes out of difference. Remember, it's, it's cat only because it's not bat or mat. He agrees with that idea of difference. However, and here's the change, he does not share their faith in structure. Derrida argues instead, here comes the word defer, that every time we think we have found a center, it always points back to some other center or signified. And thus, meaning is perpetually deferred. In other words, I've got a signifier and I trace it back to a signify, to the origin of it. But you know what I find? I find out that that's really not a signify, it's another signifier. And so I follow that to another signify, which itself is a signify, and I never get out of it. In other words, every time I think I found the meaning, it's just another signifier pointing somewhere else, bing, boing, bang, and we never get back to meaning. Meaning is perpetually deferred. Not just difference, but it is perpetually deferred. We can't get to a source. In fact, whenever we try to get to the center or meaning of a text, we end up trapped in an aporia. That's a word he used. It is a Greek word, and it means wayless. Aporia is a state of suspension in which meaning is always already deferred. That's a little jargon, a little Derridian jargon, always already. In other words, it's now, but it's always been. In other words, whenever I try to find a sender, I end up in an aporia, wayless. I'm lost, I'm caught, I'm in a state of suspension, and I'm froze. I can't go anywhere because I can't get back to meaning. That's the word aporia. That's actually used quite uh, often uh, in theory these days. Uh, there's no way to get back. I should mention, by the way, that Keats's idea of negative capability actually is a little bit linked to aporia. Now, I certainly don't think Keats would be a deconstructionist, but there's a touch there. I mean, what we thought of as negative capabilities, like aporia, were suspended. So it's interesting. There's a link there. All right, proposition three. If it can be known, it cannot be communicated. So let's say there is a logos. Let's say we can know it. Even if we can know it, we can't communicate it. Now, for this, we find the echo of this in Derrida's insistence that there has been a breakdown of signifier and signified. The big question for deconstruction is, can writing as a system of arbitrary signification capture or even express meaning? The answer for the deconstructionist would be no. In other words, signifier and signified are not only arbitrary, they're completely broken down. You really can't get from one to the other. They're, they're, they're really, really arbitrary, if you want to put it that way. We can't get back to meaning. We can't. The language does not embody or incarnate meaning. We can't get there. Now, if you're thinking, in this step-by-step -step affirmation of Gorgias's proposition, we see again the progressive rejection of ontology, epistemology, and linguistics. Think about it. Nothing exists. That's a rejection of ontology, the study of being. If it, can, if it does exist, it cannot be known. That's a rejection of epistemology. What is epistemology? The study of knowing. If it can be known, it cannot be communicated. That's a breakdown in linguistics. Even words have no meaning. See how it works? Isn't that beautiful? All right. Let's come to the Christian part. We've seen how Derrida rejects the Platonic metaphysic. Now let us see how deconstruction marks a rejection of Trinitarian and incarnational Christianity. Now again, I must pause and say, please, when I say it is anti-Christian, I do not mean it's anti-moral or anti-ethical. C.S. Lewis told us this in Mere Christianity, that our word Christian has come to have no meaning. Christianity used to have a meaning, a certain metaphysical meaning about Christ and all that. Today it means somebody you like. <laughs> so again, when I, when I use it, I use it in the C.S. Lewis version. In other words, uh, Christianity is a certain metaphysics, the Trinity and the Incarnation particularly. Um, <clears throat> although Derrida himself is a pretty ethical man, he rejects the metaphysic of Christianity. And indeed, 
Deconstruction is incompatible with the Christian belief, as we've seen before, that in Jesus of Nazareth, perfect manhood and godhood combined. Or, to put it metaphysically, that God is wholly transcendent and wholly imminent, right? The Christian belief, again, is that God is transcendent outside the world. Let me, let me, let me explain to you how Christianity is different. Okay, Jews and Muslims and deists, they believe in a transcendent God. They believe in a God that's perfect and outside of the world and created everything. Okay? Eastern religions in general, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, <clears throat> Confucianism, tend to believe in imminence. In other words, God is part of this world, right? He's the, even the sort of New Age we call today tends to believe in imminence. What makes the Christian metaphysic unique, and this is the one way it's unique, or maybe the only way it's really unique, is that they believe that God is completely transcendent, but at one moment in history, God became imminent in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. So let's think of it this way. At one point in history, a signified, indeed the transcendental signified, came down and became a signifier. I like to call this redemptive logocentrism. If Plato is logocentrism, Christianity is redemptive logocentrism because it says you can bring the two together. We've kind of seen this before, but I'm trying to explain it to you in a different way today. Well, again, for for Derrida, that's the ultimate illusion. There's no way you can bring the two together. Signified and signified have nothing to do with each other. There's no essential link there. Now, in the same way that Plato answered Gorgias, the Bible also offers an answer to Gorgias. I'll show you something. This is kind of neat, the way it works. Think of the prologue to John's Gospel. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, right? The prologue. All right. Proposition 1 for Gorgias. Nothing exists. What does John 1, 1 say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We all know that, right? That is, in a way, an answer to nothing exists. It says, yes, something does exist. The Logos. Okay. If it does exist, it cannot be known. John 1, 14, another famous verse. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. In other words, not only is there a Logos that exists and is transcendent, at some point, it came into the world and was known. That's that incarnation idea we've talked about so often in this series. Finally, if it, cannot, if it can be known, it cannot be communicated. All right, what is John 1.18, the end of the prologue? No one has ever seen God, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has made Him known. And you know the Greek there can also mean He has communicated or He has narrated Him. So again... The Logos, for both for Plato and for Christianity, exists, can be known, and can be communicated. Let's bring some of these ideas together. Deconstruction, therefore, is both anti-structural and anti-incarnational. Not only does it reject metaphysically the fusion of divine and human, not only does it reject it in that theological sense I've been talking about, but it rejects it, uh, it rejects the possibility for higher transcendent truth or meaning to be incarnated in any form, any aesthetic form. So in the same way that there's no, uh, whatever, theological incarnation, there also can be no aesthetic incarnation. Do you see how, again, what Derrida is doing something very different. This is a completely new metaphysic. In fact, it's not a metaphysic at all, again, Derrida would say. Again, this Christian idea, uh, see, isn't it interesting that, 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 that Jesus is referred to as the Word? And that's why there's such a link to aesthetics, because there's an idea, not just that God became flesh, but the Word, the Logos, became flesh. So again, we're, we're really speaking in aesthetic terms here. Uh, the same thing, and this is another weird thing about the Bible, I'm not sure how this came about, but not only is the phrase Word of God used for Christ, it's also used for the Bible. Log, uh, logos, what is it? Uh, of God, logu, uh, whatever. Logos theu, that's what it is, the Word of God. Now, again, this idea that the Bible is divine and human, is again another answer to Gorgias and something that goes against deconstruction. All right, hopefully you've got that idea now. Now, I want to bring it back and, and say something kind of funny here, okay? What I'm going to argue is that the reason it took Gorgias 2,500 years to come back in the form of Derrida is that obviously the Platonic and Christian system that I've been trying to lay out for you must be very strong and supple. And revisionist history aside, that is the foundation of Western civilization. Bible and Plato, basically, and, you know, throw in Homer along with Plato. That's the foundation of Western civilization. And again, I think that those metaphysics have been so strong that they've been keeping Gorgias in check. Indeed, we might say, with a smile on our face, that Plato and Augustine trounced poor old Gorgias so severely 
that it took him a couple of millennia to recover. So, again, there's a little bit of fun there. All right, now, I've been kind of tough on Derrida, partly because Derrida is tough on everybody else, so I think he can take it. But now, I want to be fair at the end here, because Derrida is not thinking the way I'm thinking. Let me explain. Okay. For somebody who's a Platonist or a Christian or works within that metaphysic, the Derridian idea of aporia is tantamount to being in Dante's dark wood of error. I mean, for a lot of people, you'd say, my God, if Derrida's right, I might as well just hang myself right now. I mean, to a lot of people working within that metaphysic, the traditional one, they'd be crazy. Forget about that. But, and this is where I'm going to be fair to him, for Derrida, aporia is not a negative state. He's not running off and killing himself. He's excited about it. He thinks it is not negative. It should not call for a nostalgic longing for meaning or presence as it does in Rousseau. He spends a lot of time deconstructing Rousseau. Although Rousseau is important to modernism too, Rousseau always had this nostalgia trying to look back, and he particularly saw himself as a center or origin. Derrida says no. Deconstruction should not make us look back and say, oh, I miss the good old days when meaning meant something. No, for Derrida and his deconstructionists, deconstruction is positive, and deconstructive aporia particularly, is positive. It marks, as it does in Nietzsche, the joyous affirmation of the play of the world and of the innocence of becoming. See, for, for, for Derrida, like for Nietzsche, this is affirmative. It's good. It means there's free play. You get rid of Plato, you get rid of the Bible, you're free, right? I mean, and, you know, these things do put boundaries in our life, right? They tell us what to do and what not to do. But here, it's, deconstruction sets us free. So, again, I, I want to emphasize that for Derrida, this is great. This is positive. And it frees us in two ways, deconstruction and aporia. It frees us first from being bound by any fixed truths or origins. That's obvious. We're not bound by them anymore. But even more, it frees us from any guilt we might feel over the absence of meaning. See, a lot of people don't believe there's truth anymore, but they feel guilty about it. Like Woody Allen, I haven't done anything, but I feel guilty anyway. We feel guilty like there should be some kind of truth. There should be an origin. There should be a, a logos. What Derrida is saying, the Logos is not there, and don't long after, don't feel guilty. Just accept the world with an affirmation. And that's one thing I've got to respect about Derrida. He's pretty straightforward. Now, in this affirmation, I believe, Derrida is much like the existentialist Jean-Paul Sartre, we've mentioned several times, who felt that the absence, Sartre did, who felt that the absence of a higher plan or purpose in our lives did not render life meaningless, but made our choices even more vital. You would think if somebody believed what Sartre did, why doesn't he hang himself? No, for Sartre, that's good. It means we're free, and that it's our choices that make the world. So again, for Sartre, like for Derrida, this is positive. It's maybe hard for a metaphysician to believe that, but it's positive. Let me end with a, uh, an example to kind of tie things together with Oedipus uh, Rex, with Oedipus the King. There's that scene in Oedipus I told you way back when, where for a moment, Oedipus, and also Jocasta, think that they have escaped their fate. And they're all excited, and they raise their fist up at heaven and say, Ha! Why do we have to listen to screaming birds? All those prophecies are foolish. We are just sports of chance, groping in the darkness. Now... The way you read that will show you whether you're a traditionalist or a, De or a Deridian, a deconstruction. A traditionalist, when they hear that, they're terrified. They say, wait a minute. If the prophecies are wrong, if everything's just a sport of chance, if we're in the dark, then life is meaningless, right? We're in the dark wood of error. But another way to read that is, the deconstructive way to read it is, wait a minute, that means we're free. Nobody tells us what to do. All right, everything's dark, but at least it's my darkness, and I choose it. Now, Sophocles goes with the first one. Sophocles says, no, we've got to go back to what he called ananke, necessity. We've got to go back to the rule of law and fate and prophecy. But Derrida would have a different uh, interpretation, very, very un-Aristotelian. He would say, no, that's good. We're sports of chance. You know, both Derrida and C.S. Lewis would say we live in the Shadowlands. For Derrida, that's good. Let's stay in the Shadowlands. For C.S. Lewis, it's only good because the higher reality is yet to come. So, again, I hope we can understand Derrida and deconstruction. In our last, final lecture, we will look at varieties of postmodern theory.